Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, <clears throat> Giving the Gift of Love Through Estate and Financial Planning. I'm so glad you've joined us, whether you're joining us live or on demand later, either way, I'm glad that you're here to get the information that's so important for everybody. Uh, just jumping right in, we are here tonight. Oh, before I start, I'd like to also mention that we have a guest here tonight, Brian Harper Lewis, financial strategist who will be sharing some insight with us later on in the presentation, but he is here and I want to welcome him. My name is Samra A. Stevenson. I'm the owner and operator of S.A. Stevenson Law Offices, Office Without Walls and Wills on Wheels. And I'm very pleased to be here tonight giving you a presentation on how you can show love, not just to yourself, but to the people that you love and care about. And I'm going to even broaden that out to the wider community through discussing, planning, um, putting a plan in place, because this is self-care, this is self-love. Might sound corny, but it really isn't. This is taking care of ourselves and making sure things are in order so that we can thrive and be secure and all of those things. So I hope that you're listening for the things that apply to you. Again, I'm the owner and operator of S.A. Stevenson Law Offices, Office Without Walls and Wheels on Wheels. I have been in a practicing attorney for just about 10 years now, practicing trust and estates for six and uh, I created Wills on Wheels, uh, Wills on Wheels um, to, uh, well, I advocate a lot for access to justice and um, access to information and legal services. So Wills on Wheels was created with the idea of um, bringing estate planning to people in where they are comfortable. So I take Wills and the estate planning process into people's homes. Um, the other entities you see on the screen right now are also relevant to me, but we're talking about Wills on Wheels today and financial and estate planning. Um, so what are you gonna learn today? Well, we're gonna go over the fact that this, as the state has a plan for you, whether you have one or not, um, and whether or not you wanna opt into that. Um, why form documents, maybe form documents you've seen that are relevant to estate planning are not ideal and generally don't work. And what next steps you can take to make sure that you're planning, not just for you, but the, for the ones that you love. And even if you're not planning, maybe just getting this information out there. So who can you give a loving gift to through estate and financial planning? I talked a little bit about, about that already. There's some obvious ones like your parents, um, children, if you have children, extended family, friends. Um, so when I say giving them the gift, it can be actually giving them a gift of paying for a plan for them, paying for a set of documents for them, that kind of thing. And it could just be sharing information, giving the gift of this information, empowering people, letting them know what their options are before they end up in a situation that can be crippling. So sharing that with your community. Um, I'm even going to encourage you to share this information on social media. If you get into your own planning, tell people about it if you're, if you're comfortable with it. Um, but this is information that should be out there, should be accessible to everybody. So I just want to, that's who we're giving the gift of love to today. Parents, children, extended family, friends, and sharing the information with your community, making sure people know about this stuff. So for some basics, whether you have a plan in place or not, the state has a plan for you. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you fail to plan, there is a backup and they are in the form of laws, statutes, and how the state has uh, put together uh, what they will do with your estate and your assets or you in the event that you haven't put a plan in place. And if you have engaged in some estate planning, there might be still some loopholes and some pockets that you need to address in making sure your plan is complete and effective. And I'll touch on that as well. We're going to be talking about a few different things today. I'm going to start off talking about medical advance directives. Medical advance directives, what you need to know about these. So what are medical advance directives? Also referred to as healthcare directives. They're documents that you create naming an agent to make decisions for you on your behalf if you are incapacitated or unable to render those decisions yourself. So decisions regarding your health care, okay? Um, if you're in, in an accident in the hospital, whether you're unconscious or just not able to make the decision for yourself, somebody has to do that. And if you haven't named somebody, you don't know who that's going to be and you don't know if they're going to follow your wishes or not. Um, it gives instructions to these people as well on what your preferences would be. So they know they're guided as part of that. Um, and it also allows them to access medical records because we all know HIPAA laws are put some preventative, put some barriers between people trying to help you sometimes and what the law allows. So giving those, getting those HIPAA waivers in place and making sure that your loved ones can talk to doctors um, and medical providers and, and access information they need to in order to help you 
when you're not able to. And I'm going to touch, this is not just about people when they're older, okay? And this will come in later into the presentation. If you have adult children over the age of 18, guess what? You, when they turned 18, guess what you got nixed out of? Making those decisions for them legally um, and being able to access that information if something happens to them. I'm betting you're still footing the bill. But so you might want to be able to make those, be a part of making those decisions. Um, so my story, I always like to tie in real stories to why this stuff is important. I'm going to have lots of stories going on today, but this one is mine. Um, I found myself, this is the two year anniversary from uh, my, I found myself two years ago on today's date in a hospital in another state, I won't disclose that. Um, and I was in a lot of pain and I was seeking medical attention and I was actually denied medical treatment for uh, over 30 hours. Um, and did not get the help I needed until I discharged myself from a hospital and went to another one seeking the help there. But during that time, my mom was able to uh, to um, confer with doctors, access things, be in touch throughout the process and, and be able to be there for me because I had a medical direct, advance direct in place. I had it saved in a cloud. I had that on my phone. I was able to show that to doctors um, and she was able to talk to people as a result of that. Um, now, I wasn't incapacitated, but I did have to then go into surgery. And so I was not available to render decisions for myself, but she was there for my backup. And so having just that, that's a real life example. It's very scary. Um, if you've never been in a situation like that, you don't want to wait until you are to, um, you know, make sure that you have someone who can be there for you and supporting you. Um, so if you become incapacitated without proper health care directives, um, if this were, let's just say this were an extended period of time that I didn't have, uh, that, that I need to be in, 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 the, in care. Um, I, uh, if my mom hadn't been named as a, my medical, uh, on my medical advance directive, she very well may have had to have gone to court to um, assist me. But there are real world examples for that that I have as well too. I've seen plenty of times when um, clients come into my office, it's because they are needing to seek guardianship as a result of not planning ahead with medical advance directive. So, Perfect example of this is a client that came to see me a few years ago. Um, her mother was in a nursing home and her mother had been being transported by an orderly and was ejected from a wheelchair, breaking both of her arms, two black eyes. And it was a lawsuit that resulted with them winning. But in the time it took to settle that lawsuit, mom developed dementia and was an unable to sign the settlement papers, unable to, the family was unable to access that money from that lawsuit, which was needed to pay her medical bills. And so they had to come see me to seek guardianship, which was a several month process and a several thousand dollar process for them. Um, had they had those documents in place prior to that happening, they wouldn't have had to have wor worried about that. Daughter could have signed on her behalf and made that money accessible. So a medical advance directive for people, whether <laughs> regardless of age, but um, thinking ahead towards uh, whether you're caring for somebody, if you're going to be caring for somebody, if you think you're going to be in a position for caring some, for somebody, making sure a medical advance directive in place is in place is important. Um, who needs one? I mentioned before, anybody over the age of 18, you adult children going to college, pay attention. This is important. Um, getting a health directive in place for your child so that you can be there for them and support them. Your parents, you have aging parents, you're going to be caring for them, making sure you're doing that. Just perfect example in the story I gave prior. And most importantly, you. Who's going to be looking out for you? Are you taking the steps that you need to to make sure your family can be there? Your family can be the most supportive people possible. If you don't put those things in place to make sure they can be there for you, they're not going to be able to be effective with that. So the short answer is everybody. <laughs> Have medical advance directives apply to everybody, anybody over the, over the age of 18. Why you can't rely on form documents. And there may be plenty of reasons why you've explored form documents, gone after doing this on your own. And just a little bit of a warning to you, um, the form documents don't cover everything. Um, form documents, I've highlighted the first two bullets. Um, I have seen form documents go over hydration and, hydration and nutrition and pregnancy directives. Some of them do, I have seen that. So I've highlighted the, the latter portion of that um, provision for specific desires, um, your care, including diet visitors. Those are things that are in documents that are uh, created by attorneys. 
because they know the specific ins and outs and the things that you need to address. And more importantly, for what's relevant to, to, to today is COVID has changed what you need to put in a medical advance directive. Think about when we were at the height of this pandemic. People were not getting into hospitals. People were going in, checking in, and their family was not able to see them. Some in some cases, never again. Your medical advance directive should address that, should address remote communication with doctors, entities. If it's not in writing in there, there's no guarantee that they have to allow your family to talk to you. So COVID has changed some things. Those things can't be found in form documents. Really appropriate to seek counsel from an attorney on that to make sure you're being complete. Jumping into protecting real property and assets 101. So how you take title matters. And I just wanna stress this, the only reason at the, time of, at the time that you might pass, the only reason for a court to involve themselves with your assets is to take them out of your name. Let me repeat that. The only reason for the court to involve themselves with your assets is to take them out of your name. Let's say you live in, you, let's say you own the house that you're living in right now. If you were to sell that house, you would sign your, you know, your, um, you would sign title away through a quick claim deed or some other transfer of document, um, giving ownership to another entity or to another party. You would sign on the dotted line physically. If you are passed, if you passed away, obviously you can't do that. And that's why the courts need to get involved in order to retitle your assets, in order to transfer ownership from you to somebody else when you're not here to authorize that. That's how the courts get involved. So when people create trusts, which maybe you've come here to listen uh, to about the, maybe you have questions about trust today. Well, I'll tell you that trusts are a vehicle, right? It's a, uh, it's a living, breathing document. It's a, it's a vehicle by which you can um, house your assets. And I know this might sound complicated. Feel free to hit me up for a call after this if you need more explanation. But essentially, when people say they want to avoid probate, or how you avoid probate is, is really to sidestep. You're not really avoiding probate. The only way to avoid probate is not to die. But when you retitle your assets into the name of the trust, which is like a vehicle, um, when they pass to your beneficiaries, to anybody you're leaving them to, to your, to, your, to your loved ones, they don't need to go through the court probate process and be retitled because you've already taken care of that by putting them into the name of a trust. So they don't bear your name, but you retain control of them. And so that's how a trust becomes um, an, a vehicle for the protection and housing of assets. It will be too complicated tonight to get into how that avoids taxing and those types of things, but essentially how things are titled matters because it matters how they pass from one person to the other if something happens to you. Um, and planning also allows you to remove the risk of losing everything. So here I'm talking about um, owning real property and possibly uh, whether you're whether you're renting it out to somebody or not um, taking ownership of that property in the name of a trust could be important um, we have concerns about liability so uh, inside liability risk related to the property such as injuries to tenants and their guests or damages to the tenants and property so this is talking to people who are renting out um, real estate property maybe you're renting out the entire house maybe you're renting out a room but you've created liabilities here um, and the way that you're using your assets. Outside liabilities include, include risks unrelated to the property, such as car accidents, a business transaction, a business injury, or a malpractice claim, being sued, all of those things. So um, we have liabilities when it comes to, we have assets. When we have assets, we have to think about liabilities because we have to think about who might be coming after them. And it matters how they're titled because it matters whether they can get to you or not. So. Right now, I'm talking about um, main, protecting your real property through creating an LLC, which is one strategy. Um, taking your, putting your property into an LLC creates a barrier um, and in case anything does happen. So let's say somebody gets hurt on that property um, and somebody wants to sue you. If the house or the real property is in an LLC, the assets that they're going after are part of that LLC and that LLC account, which undoubtedly probably has less money than your personal accounts, and you don't want them coming after your personal account. So putting that real estate property into an LLC is a good idea. I went too fast on these slides, but as you can see, I'm jumping into some of the basics. Real estate is considered a hot asset. This is why it's important to talk about this. Um, different from a cold asset like a brokerage account or um, 
stocks and those types of things, it carries naturally just carries liability. So keeping those assets segregated from each other and segregated from your other assets is important. You can do that by creating a trust and again, retitling things, keeping an LLC and creating those additional protections for yourself while you own that property, regardless of what you're doing it. So you can be placed that asset into a limited liability company. In addition to that, I would suggest that you have that limited liability company be owned by a, um, by a trust, two layers of protection um, that will allow you to protect those assets. Um, so just, just some things that are important with regards to the LLC. Um, and it, an LLC isn't a separate entity. It has its own taxpayer ID. Um, it must maintain formalities. This is important because if you're going to maintain those protections as part of your LLC, um, you can't make things must be clear. <laughs> you can't commingle things, um, maintain separate bank accounts, file separate tax returns for each entity. If you are to commingle, um, the problem is that if somebody's coming after you, you've created a problem where it's called it's referred to as piercing the corporate veil. You can think of the corporate veil as some kind of covering over you, um, making sure that you're not accessible through that LLC, that liability. But if you are to commingle things and make things blurry, piercing the corporate veil, eliminating those protections allows them to go over your go after your other assets. So if you're going to take that route of owning property as part of an LLC and a trust, keep in mind that it is, a, it is an entity in itself and it needs to be maintained separate from your personal effects. Um, there are different types of ways. To, I recommend taking property in the form of an LLC and not a corporation because it's a much simpler process. Um, you don't need to have certain things in place with, like with corporations and they can be member managed or manager managed, which gives you a lot of options. I won't jump into the specific, specifics of that. If you have more questions, please contact me. I'd be more than happy to go over that with you. Let's talk about talking to parents and family. Um, part of giving this gift of estate planning and state and financial planning is leading the conversation possibly, possibly leading the conversation in your family. So how do we address our family members? Um, we wanna think about the things that we can control and the things that we can't control. So what can we control? We can control thoughtfully choosing when a conversation is initiated, um, being mindful that people aren't distracted, busy, um, in a bad mood, <laughs> anything that might hinder the free flow of information, people retaining information, choosing a comfortable and familiar place to talk. So making sure people are comfortable, um, making sure that their privacy is being respected and think about their idea of privacy and not necessarily yours. Are there people around that they don't feel comfortable talking around? Um, are there people that should be included in the conversation? Uh, make sure that you are being mindful about when, where, who, all of those. Um, these are emotional conversations. And so you want to be keeping that in mind. Um, knowing in internal factors. So internal factors we can control. Where are you coming from from the inside when you're addressing your family? Know your why. Your why is your love for them. You've come to this webinar. You are interested in knowing how to give the gift of love through estate and financial planning. That's your why. Let them know your why. You're not seeking to invade their privacy, get in their business. You care for them. You care about your ability to care for them. Um, getting informed, so showing up to a webinar like today, getting informed about what the available options are so that you can actually give answers to questions and being clear about what you need from them as part of the process. So maybe you're footing the bill, but you need them to be involved. Or maybe you're not, but either way, um, being clear about what your needs are with that so that you can convey in sincerity and a confident vulnerability. And here's a good one, having your own affairs in order before you start telling people what they should be doing. So take a, take a step in your direction of your own planning, put your own affairs in place so that you can speak from experience and not from a lecturing that kind of place where it's not received quite as well when it comes to these sensitive issues. Remember, I just said it was an emotional and weighted conversation. So coming from a place of sincerity and um, knowing what you're talking about is important. What about talking to your parents? 
Well, it's important to talk to your parents <laughs> about this um, and talking to parents about this isn't easy. Um, a lot of times parents don't think that you should be talking to them about it or perhaps they just don't want to think about this or talk about it. So, but it's important because if you are not helping guide your parents, you're the one at risk. The story I just told you about the daughter that came to see me because mom was in a nursing home and they needed to seek guardianship as a result. Um, Essentially, she was the one who had to uh, carry out, take care of that, go through the, the ordeal of dealing with me. We had, it was a long process because we had people that we had to notify that we couldn't find. It can get very stressful. So you are the one at risk if you're not helping people plan. Um, you, could be the end up, end up, you could end up being the one going to court to access things, um, stuck in court after their death as a result of probate. Probate can drag on for a while. The shortest amount of time you spend in probate is six months, and that's really if there's no assets. If you created a trust, and there's no assets to go through probate. Six months is the shortest you're going to be in there. 18 months is average, years sometimes. Um, and while during that time, those assets still exist that you're dealing with, things have to be paid for or dealt with. So you're the one at risk if you're not planning or helping your family plan. Also, another thing that's important when it comes to generational planning, because that's something that's very important or being highlighted a lot right now. So are you thinking about your own generational planning? Generational planning does not have to apply to just your kids. Yes, it will, but what about you? Our generation is included in this. Are you talking to your parents about how they're leaving things to you? Are they leaving it in trust? Are they leaving it in a way that allows you to protect it from creditors, judgments, those types of things? Are they leaving it in a way that allows you to avoid taxes and keep it, keep it safe and secure? Those are conversations to have now. What are the documents that you need to keep in mind that are important when you're talking to your family and your loved ones? First and foremost, last will and testament. Without a last will and testament in place, you are said to indict intestate. The intestacy laws in the state where you passed will apply. Distribution of assets will occur in that order. Taxes will occur according to those statutes and you will be in probate court dealing with a whole bunch of things that you might or not want to and could have been avoided by just creating a last will and testament. Trusts, those come in the form of revocable trust, irrevocable trust, special needs trust, long list of trusts. Um, these are things to think about family specific. So any special needs children, we need to talk about a special needs trust to make sure that you're not leaving that child in a situation where they're going to be devoid of state and finance, state support because they've inherited money from you that puts them outside of reach of that support. A special needs trust is the only way to avoid that. Irrevocable trusts, um, revocable trusts, knowing the difference about the, those does require consulting with an attorney, feel free to give me a call. Um, but I've talked about already the benefit of taking property and trust. So financial power of attorney, healthcare directives, medical power of attorney, they're the same thing if you've heard them, they're not different. Healthcare directive is the same thing as a medical power of attorney. And lastly, a living will and a, or, and a fi final disposition. So I talked about, I didn't talk about financial power of attorney. So let me, let me pause there. A durable power of attorney or a financial power of attorney is a document that names an agent to act on your behalf with regards to your finances. Um, finances, business, a host of things, including social media <laughs> and shutting down your accounts and those types of things. So naming somebody to do those things as well as naming somebody to make healthcare de decisions for you is important. And then a living will spells out how, how you want things, how you wanna be taken care of, end stage condition, those types of things, and a final disposition tells people in your loved ones, cremation, burial, the specifics about how you want your remains handled, okay? So those are the um, five areas that you should touch on with your family to make sure that you're covering everything and what they need. A little bit of housekeeping, whether you've been involved with planning or not, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Um, so if you, have, if, the, if you have a family member or you have a trust in place, making sure that trust is funded what does that word mean? It means that you've taken the additional step, not just signing and creating the trust, but you've also taken the assets and put them into the trust. And I've already been accused by my mother of not explaining that well enough, so let me just explain. <laughs> when you fund a trust, you essentially retitle assets or put 
the title of the, the put the trust name on the title of an asset, whether it's a house, um, an LLC, uh, stocks, uh, bank accounts, those types of things um, can be uh, what that is called the funding process when we're retitling things. So making sure that a trust is funded because you can pay several thousand dollars for a trust to be created. And if you don't take it that additional step, you didn't do anything. Make sure wills are filed with the registrar or stored safely. So in some states, there are there is no registrar for safekeeping of wills. Um, for example, Connecticut. But where there is a registrar for the safekeeping of wills, it should be filed there. It's kept private, sealed until the time that you pass, and then it becomes public record. Um, if you don't have a registrar to hold that for you, which is the safest bet, um, keep it in a fireproof box in the house and let somebody know where it is. Please don't put it in your safety deposit box. If you put it in your safety deposit box, it's too safe. The only way somebody's getting into that safety deposit box is by going through probate <laughs> and getting the authorization to do so. And it's possible, and it's possible, but it's an extra step, probably some extra money and an extra frustration to, to go about that. Um, but the, the safety deposit box is essentially too safe. Um, you wanna make sure that if you keep a copy in there, that's cool. But in, unless someone has access to that so they can administer your estate later, it's too safe. Make a list of where to find account numbers, keys, and passwords. I'm lucky I have a mom who is on top of this and made my list for me. Talk to your parents about that. Talk to your family members about that. Where are things? Make lists of essential contacts like lawyers, bankers, and CPAs. Um, those are the types of things that you're going to have to be addressing. Whether somebody is incapacitated, um, whether, whether somebody has passed away or is just incapacitated, these things are relevant in making sure you know what's going on before that happens. Another example of giving the gift of love through estate planning, I thought I might touch on grandparent gifting. <laughs> um, a lot of times uh, grandparents want to give in a way, a lot of times I get clients in my office that, that are have grandchildren and they're really not interested in leaving anything to their kids. They're leaving interested in leaving things to their to their grandchildren and a lot of times they are minors. Um, so the things to keep in mind when you're leaving something to a minor, you can't <laughs> essentially, it's gonna have to be put in trust. And so you can decide whether you're going to do that yourself or whether you're gonna allow, um, whether you're gonna have, the, have it done by an attorney after you pass away, um, thereby kind of getting into giving away the money that you uh, work so hard to give away to those grandchildren you're paying now an attorney to create a trust, a few thousand dollars. This could be something you take care of in advance before you pass. Um, or this could be something a grandparent takes, uh, takes care of in advance before they pass so that doesn't have to be an instruction later. Um, now, I do wanna make sure everybody knows what their options are because not everybody's gonna be really all into creating a trust in advance. So let's say that you don't wanna go that route at least at least create a last will and testament that has language that is called a testamentary trust, right? I also like to refer the, to this as a springing trust. It is language in the will giving directives that a trust be created on behalf of a minor or somebody who hasn't reached the age that you've specified for the taking of assets, doesn't have to be 18. And in the event that, that you've passed away and that person has not reached that age or met the qualifications, a trust springs up, right? So I like to call it a springing trust. In the event that it's necessary, it springs up. So that is an option. You don't have to create a revocable trust, irrevocable trust, something that's here while you're still living. You can leave language in your will, testamentary trust, springing trust, and it, it gives directions for a trust to be created. If you don't at least do that, though, you are leaving things open-ended and the court will have to get involved with directing and appointing attorneys and paying fees. And now you're digging in to the money you left behind that you intended to be for your family. So keep your family's money in your family's hands, essentially is what I'm trying to say. Another thing to keep in mind, giving outright can imp impact college. So for those grandchildren, if they're taking right at the age of 18, um, they might not qualify for financial aid at that point in time. Creating a trust allows for protections and, and stretching that dollar out. I recommend usually that provisions be put in place that a, a, a child, an adult child, doesn't take any assets until at least age 22. And that's young, really like 25, to be honest with you, because they've been out of college for a little bit. Theoretically, 
and have an idea of how the world works a little bit more. So think about that if you're if you're leaving to a child or a grandchild, whatever. Um, what kind of planning have you done in advance to make sure that the court doesn't have to direct an attorney to get involved later? Make sure you're not digging into the inheritance that you've worked hard for and want to leave behind. And make sure you're not impacting um, that young adult's life by disqualifying them for things that they might need with regards to school. So at this juncture, I'm going to introduce Brian Harper Lewis, who's going to talk to us a little bit about retirement and long-term financial planning strategies. Um, Brian Harper, I didn't put your second last name on here, Brian, I apologize, as a financial strategist. You can see his information on the screen. I encourage you, if any of the stuff that he's talking about tonight applies to you, to reach out to him and sit down for a consult. He is extremely informative. And Brian, I will let you go ahead and start. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yep. All right, awesome. Um, so I wasn't able to um, get my video on there uh, for some reason, thanks to Zoom. <laughs> let me but, see if, um, I, let me see if I can fix. Let me see if I can fix that for you. One. Okay. Uh, no, I can't. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's all it's all good. I have a picture there. Um, so yeah. So um. I just want to go over a few things. I don't want to delay, um, you know, take up too much of your time, but um, I thank Summer for having me on um, because a, a big part of, as you can see, the information that you're talking about tonight is dealing a lot with the legal side and estate planning, but we keep talking about assets and money and protecting ourselves. Uh, one of the biggest ways that we do that um, in the financial services area is through life insurance. Um, I've spent five years um, working on life insurance, very uh, various different uh, areas of life insurance. I've worked, uh, I work with uh, four states, Maryland, DC, Virginia, and North Carolina. Um, I've also spent 12 years of banking, different areas such as cash management, lending. I spent a lot of time working with, um, with people dealing with IRAs and when someone passes away and what are their options um, during my banking time. So I'm, I'm pretty well versed in understanding how these assets move uh, when someone either passes away or is unable to act on their own behalf. Um, and so uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time more so talking about the life insurance piece tonight because it is a great vehicle for you to do all of those things at one time in regards to uh, retirement planning, asset protection, um, and, and funding um, your different affairs that you would like to leave behind as far as legacy. Um, so one thing that we, we see a lot in our society and we see on the financial side is underfunded retirement. Um, and we also see uh, underfunded uh, emergency savings. Um, these things kind of create um, debt for us. And also in a lot of cases, it increases our taxable responsibility. So life insurance can be something that we use to actually do the opposite and reduce our taxable responsibility and our debt. Um, I am one of the only infinite bankers that I know of that works with life insurance to create something we call LERPs. Um, LERPs are life insurance retirement plans. Um, with infinite banking, um, it adds another layer where you could actually put funds away to um, reduce your debt, to save um, for retirement in a tax deferred or a tax free vehicle. Um, there's other areas of LERPs as well, but the, the, the one thing I wanna stick out to you is the infinite banking, um, because that is a specialized training that an agent needs to go through in order to issue that. Um, but the main thing we want to look at with LERPs, the, the wealthy have been using this for a really long time, life insurance retirement plans. Um, you know, the way things are going, we, we, you know, what benefits we'll get from Social Security are kind of unknown. Um, but uh, there's a book called The Power of Zero by David McKnight, where he kind of talks about that. He talks about what has, what has gotten us in this financial uh, standpoint in the United States and why do we have certain um, concerns right now regarding Social Security and why, how did it get here? Um, so I won't spend too much time talking about that, but I do want you to understand that um, the the wealthy have kind of found a way to not have to worry about what those Social Security benefits might look like now or in the future. Um, and one of those ways is through the LERPs, um, and they created a tax-free retirement income. Now, I'm not telling you not to invest in your 401k or any other retirement accounts. In fact, I, I will tell you to max them out. Max out your 401k and other retirement accounts, get the full benefit, but stop there. 
Um, I would say then you want to move on to investing other methods. Um, you know, there could be there's a million ways to invest in real estate. There's a million ways to invest um, in, in different markets and things like that. But one of those ways should be something that will not have your taxable responsibility so high. A lot of 401ks, um, if you overfund them, you're going to see a big tax bill every time you want to withdraw from them um, after, at the point of retirement because you're not paying the taxes now. A lot of times um, things work one or two ways when it comes to how we look at that uh, taxes. And that's either pay now or pay later. So um, those are those are some reasons why we do that. Um, and some of the other things I want to add too is that um, you know there's other areas of life insurance, uh, other areas of our finances that we talked about tonight that life insurance can help with, such as college savings, um, asset protection, mortgage protection, um, making sure that you know if God forbid something happens to you, you know your family is not left with a hefty bill. Um, and we can talk about who is the beneficiary of that and how are those um, you know how are those different vehicles, maybe your trust or other. Um, assets that you that you uh, have um, are going to be funded if you're not here. Um, you may want to leave a legacy to a nonprofit or a religious organization or scholarship. Um, and then the other thing is too, if you own a business, you want to keep your business uh, in your name. You want to keep a legacy going. But if you're not there, who runs the business? Um, there's a normally a tax free be um, benefit to pay out, but there's also key uh, key and per key person insurance um, to make sure that you have your business is able to, to continue. So those are a couple of things that you want to consider. Um, and then my last thing too, is just uh, make sure you have beneficiaries on your bank accounts um, and other monies and your beneficiaries, uh, like Samra said, I've seen it where, um, and I definitely will yield to uh, her uh, legal advice, but I have seen it in banking where um, a trust is the beneficiary. Um, I've seen that before. So I will yield to what she advises you on that, but make sure that um, that asset is also covered. I see a lot of times people do not name a beneficiary. Um, that's something you don't want to do. Um, I've seen in banking where your, your um, heirs cannot do anything for you um, be, or they can't access those funds um, it, or they have to go through the um, register of wills and, and other avenues to get that information. Um, and um, what you'll see there on the screen is I do have a link um, for those of you who want to apply for life insurance. You say, hey, Brian, I really don't need a consultation. Um, I kind of know what I need um, and I just want to go for it with it. I do. I am a part of Ethos, uh, which you all may have seen their commercials. You can uh, easily apply for life insurance. There is under five minutes if you're applying for um, in, uh, life insurance policy, one million dollars or less. Um, you, you will not see um, any medical exam needed there. If you want to take a deeper dive and you want to go through um, different areas of life insurance, you want me to look at more of your assets and see where there might be some possibilities I can help you out or even just make referrals for you because um, I work with a lot of different financial professionals um, like Samra and, and there's several others. Um, definitely please email me. Um, my email is brianconsultations at, gmail, at gmail.com and um, I'll definitely help you there and um, get you situated with an appointment and we can go from there. Or if you have questions on the, on the uh, other insurance from Ethos, I can help with that as well. So I look forward to helping everyone and um, I look forward to the rest of the presentation actually. Thank you, Brian. I just want to note that I forgot the S. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but it should be Brian's, B-R-I-A-N-S consultations. I put the correct one in the chat. And what Brian was talking about with regards to naming beneficiaries is true. It is a great to a trust can be a great tool for extending controls and protections over assets you're leaving with minors or adult children um, through life insurance and, and uh, retirement uh, retirement assets. Uh, essentially, if when you name a beneficiary as a child, if they're already a minor or even if they're not a minor, they're getting that money outright could be a hindrance to what your goals are with that. If you're intending for them to hold on to that for a longer period of time, it might be beneficial for you to create a trust and you name the, ben the um, beneficiary as the trust. So your trust becomes your beneficiary, your plan pays out to your trust, your trust stipulates what the uh, parameters are with regards to someone taking control of those assets, when they do it, how they do it, whether they never do it, whether it remains um, a lifetime protected asset, which I don't have time to delve into today because I've already gone over, but let's talk about dynasty trust just for a simple, because I thought, if, just for a second, because I thought dynasty trusts were something that were way out of my league. Wrong. Um, <laughs> I actually think of Jay-Z first, but dynasty trusts are essentially, uh, are also referred to as cascading trusts, are just 
and what Brian was saying, what the wealthy have been doing for years, finding a way to make sure that trust roll into one another after each person's lifetime. It's not that complicated. You can have that type of setup for your kids where they can then roll those assets into their into uh, estate planning for their own children. And you, there you have a dynasty just like that. Um, so naming a beneficiary as a trust from a life insurance, from a retirement policy, they're not going to get any controls or protections in any other way unless you do that because those policies are paying those out. They're not holding on to them for you. All right. I've already gone over, but I did want to talk. Thank you, Brian, by the way. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about naming guardians. This is another way you can give love through estate and financial planning. It's not all about money, guys. It's sometimes about the kids. Six common mistakes when people are naming um, guardians for the children. People choose couples and not individuals. A lot of times you pick Mary and, Mary and Joe, the happy married couple. That's fine. Um, but which one of those people would you like to be overseeing what's going on with your children in the event that they get divorced or one um, or something happens? Picking an individual rather than picking a couple kind of guarantees that you're getting at your goals um, and how you want your kids raised in terms of values and principles and those types of things. Not enough alternatives. You name one person, and then if that person's not available or unwilling, what happens? It's the state's plan again. What is the state's plan? State's plan is your children's becoming a, a ward of the state. I don't think that's what you want. Anything's better than child protective services. If you can't, if you're stuck on something, I'm just saying anything's better than child protective services. I usually tell people just to pick whatever they'd be okay with for the next three years. Let's take it out of the time frame of an entire lifetime. Just pick somebody you'd be cool with for the next three years. Consider financial resources when naming guardians. Whether you put financial put, put things in place in terms of creating a trust so that they can the guardians will be able to raise them. If that's not something that's an option, are you picking people that have the ability to um, support your children? Um, not naming a financial guardian. Um, the financial guardian can be separate from the guardian of the person. Let's keep that in mind. Values, how somebody manages money. You might be okay with somebody, how they're doing with the values and the, and the principles and all those things, but you don't like how they manage money. You can separate the two of those things. Um, for getting short-term guardians, and I don't have time to talk about kids' protection plans, but short-term guardians are important. Let's, let's say you go out to dinner, you leave children with, with babysitter. Um, you don't come home, whether it's because something happens to you tragically and you've passed away or you're just <laughs> and you're just incapacitated and in the hospital. Police are not leaving those children, that child with the babysitter or the neighbor. They're taking them to child, child protective services because they don't have the authority to do anything else. Naming short term guardians, putting an emergency plan in place, essential. Forgetting to exclude undesirables who might challenge a designation of guardian. It's important to note that you're naming guardians, right? And, and, and I was talking about the kids protection plan and naming short term guardians. Those are guardian standalone guardianship documents that are separate from a will. That's important because guardianship comes out outside the context of someone passing away. Someone's incapacitated. We're not looking at a will to figure out who the guardian is. Get some, get some standalone guardianship documents in place, name short term guardians, and make sure you express your clear wishes about who you do not want to have custody of your children. Because the guardianship papers aren't the legally effective handing over the children and giving that person authority. They still have to go to court and get custody. And so your guardianship wishes and your expressions of that are your voice in that courtroom during that custody. If it's a dispute, a dispute. You should be listing people you don't want having custody of them. Otherwise, no one else is going to be speaking up to that. Okay? Maybe there's some family members that you just don't sit well. They don't doesn't sit well with you them having custody. I'm not talking about a legal a legal parent. Maybe you don't like dad and you you can express your, your wishes, but um, yeah, I won't go down that road. Um, so just a few more last things. Your default estate plan is probate. I've already gone over this. Probate can be a lengthy, expensive process that digs into the assets and all of the things that you're leaving behind in your legacy. Putting a plan in place eliminates this being your default plan. This is the state's plan. Um, something else to keep in mind. Another reason why people create trust is a privacy interest. I mentioned that a last will and testament when filed with the Registry of Wills is kept under lock and seal, but when you pass away, it becomes public record. Anybody can walk down to the courthouse, open up, go to Register of Wills, look at the will, see how you've left things. That might not be important to you. It might be though. 
Your trust is your own private information. Nobody sees that. What gets filed with the register is what's called a pour over will. It's like a four page document that says this is none of your business, essentially. That's not, I'll just put it like that. It basically tells the court there's a trust that exists. This, these assets don't belong here. We've named uh, the beneficiary of this will, the trust, send it over there. Keep this out of probate. So I've gone way over. I apologize for that, but I hope you've enjoyed the information. I want to say thank you again to Brian Harper Lewis for his. Um, I love when you talk about financial planning, Brian, um, for his contributions tonight. You have his information. If you need it, uh, anything else, please feel free to reach out to me. Here's my information. Uh, it's simple to get started with the estate planning process with us. Um, go ahead and book a 15 minute screening call. You will be speaking to me directly. Um, and we will determine what the right course of action for you is. You can do that pri <laughs> privately. You do not need to call my office and speak to anybody if you do not wish to. However, if you wish to call, the number is 301-795-2728 or email me directly. I do recommend just taking advantage of the um, uh, Book Like a Boss website where you can book online. It's the, the address is on the, the screen, bookme.name slash office without walls. That will take you directly to my calendar. You can pick a time that's comfortable for you and I will reach out to you. Thank you so much for attending, giving the gift of love through estate planning. I hope that you uh, will join us for um, our, join me for my next webinar. I'm sure I'll have Ryan on again. Um, and you all have a, a fabulous night. Bless. <laughs>